All right, we have a fantastic uh, session planned today, so I'm going to go ahead and get started while we still have folks coming in and joining us. Hello and welcome to this webinar on improving diabetes care quality in rural communities. My name is Arielle and I'm the program manager at the National Center for Equitable Care for Elders, and we're glad you can join us. Related to older adult health and healthcare, we would certainly love for you to stay connected with us uh, during the session and after this session. You can see our Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, website, and email listed below. Uh, we're certainly uh, grateful for your time and participation uh, during this pandemic. Health centers specifically play an important role in responding to older adults' uh, needs. We'd love for you to check out our resources page on our website that's dedicated to COVID-19 resources related to older adults. If you haven't already uh, heard about the Health Center Resource Clearinghouse, that's also a fantastic website to utilize when you're looking for information uh, in general around special and vulnerable populations uh, that are served by health centers um, or specifically around COVID-19, there are a lot of fantastic um, guidelines, webinars, other resources that we'd encourage you to check out there. Just a few reminders. Uh, because we have a fantastic uh, group today, lots of folks in the Zoom, we're gonna keep lines muted to prevent echo and background noise. If you have questions or comments, we'd love for you to utilize the chat box during the session and at the end where we'll have a dedicated uh, spot for questions. We are recording this session and that will be available uh, via a YouTube link um, sometime in the next week, but we will send a copy of the PDF slides uh, to all registrants as soon as this session wraps up. We'd love to hear your feedback, certainly shapes future training opportunities that we provide. So we'd love for you to fill out our brief valuation that will be available at the end of this session. So you may have seen these learning objectives when you registered for this webinar. Uh, through today's uh, presentation, we're going to be hopefully touching on the impact of living in rural communities on diabetes and the risk for complications uh, from untreated chronic conditions. Hopefully being able to explore the uses and benefits of telehealth, both, both generally and now uh, in this time of COVID-19, as well as talking about opportunities for um, partnership and care coordination with local entities to uh, provide uh, resources around diabetes self-management. Today's featured present presenter uh, will be Dr. Sarah Sai. Uh, she is currently the Geriatric Diabetes Fellow at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Joslin Diabetes Center in Boston, Massachusetts. She completed her training in internal medicine and geriatric medicine at the University of British Columbia, Canada. She has previous outreach experience serving older adults living in rural communities in Northern BC. Dr. Sai, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Arielle, for the introduction. Um, so I have the pleasure today of uh, laying down the groundwork and uh, discussing some of the challenges that older adults with diabetes face living in rural communities. And um, later on in my talk, I'll present um, some successful models um, of diabetes care for these patients. So for older adults living in rural areas, um, for those who are above the age of 65, currently there's about 22.9% um, that are living in a rural community. And as you can see in the figure, um, over time, uh, this percentage has increased um, significantly, and it's estimated to grow um, to over 25% uh, by 2040. Um, and you can see that really, um, majority of older adults are living in rural communities compared to the metropolitan area. Next slide, please. Uh, this figure just shows the distribution of older adults um, in rural and urban uh, communities by region. Uh, and as you can see here, 
majority of older adults in rural communities are in the self regions as well as the Midwest uh, regions uh, compared to the urban communities where it's more evenly distributed. Next slide. Uh, this figure from the U.S. Census Bureau uh, presents the states with the largest percentage of older adults uh, living in rural areas, and the top two states are Vermont uh, and Maine, um, and I'm sure we're, we're looking forward to Dr. Brennan and Debbie's uh, presentation on Maine in just a bit, um, but also uh, states that are in the Midwest and Southern regions also make up the top states with the largest percentage of older adults. Next slide. In terms of older adults with diabetes, uh, we know that the prevalence of diabetes in the states um, for those above the age of 65 is 26.8%. Um, and this is really gonna increase uh, over the next few years due to an aging population uh, with those above the age of 85 years um, being the largest growth. Um, about 16% um, have impairment of an instrumental activity of daily living. And what that means is that they may need assistance with driving, the finances, managing medications, cooking, cleaning, or shopping. About 10% have an impairment of a basic activity of daily living. Um, they might need help with dressing, bathing, grooming, feeding or toileting themselves. And more than half of these older adults have some form of mobility limitation requiring either a walker or a cane um, uh, for assistance. Um, what we know is that in rural communities, um, diabetes is estimated to be about 17% more prevalent uh, than in urban communities. And so it's definitely a growing concern. Next slide. In terms of challenges uh, for older adults living in rural communities in general, there's system-related challenges and patient-related challenges. For system-related challenges, there's higher rates of poverty in these regions. Um, there's more limited access to insurance. There may be physician shortages, particularly with primary care providers. Um, there's very limited access to specialty medical uh, care. Um, and emergency services, limited access to home supports, uh, such as visiting nurses um, and even nursing homes. There's less transportation and a larger geographic range that needs to be covered. There's less access to safe sidewalks and walking tracks uh, and less exercise facilities and grocery stores. On the patient-related level, um, we know that um, older adults living in rural communities have higher rates of chronic conditions uh, such as diabetes, uh, cancer, heart uh, disease, uh, depression, and cognitive dysfunction. Um, and these individuals have a lower activity of daily living function. They have lower social functioning due to smaller social networks. Um, they tend to report lower self-reported uh, health status. Um, and in general, um, this type, this population is not well studied um, and there's not much research. Uh, next slide. There are some additional challenges uh, for those uh, living with diabetes. Um, first, there's minimal exposure to diabetes education. Um, this uh, poster from the CDC um, just shows that there's only 62% six, of rural counties don't have a diabetes self-management education and support program, uh, which, is, which are quite essential for preventing complications of diabetes. Um, these older adults have higher rates of poorly controlled diabetes with hemoglobin A1C greater than 9%. There's less glucose monitoring by finger sticks and hemoglobin A1C checks, less screening for retinopathy, uh, monitoring for uh, diabetic nephropathy. Uh, these patients are less likely to have blood pressure under control. Uh, they have higher rates of foot problems um, and less accessibility to endocrinologists. Next slide. Um, so this um, diagram shows um, accessibility to endocrinologists in terms of a 20 mile buffer. And what you can see is that um, in the darker blue color surrounded by the red, um, that represents 100% um, accessibility uh, for older adults. Um, and 
the accessibility make, plays a factor in terms of where um, um, urban sites are located. Um, so you can see that there's really no accessibility um, in the Midwest and southern parts of the states. And um, if we recall from previous slides, this is actually where majority of older adults um, are living. Um, so this is a, an issue that's growing. Uh, next slide. And I just want to remind you that diabetes care is so important um, to prevent the macrovascular and microvascular complications of diabetes. Um, for macrovascular, it includes coronary artery disease, stroke, peripheral artery disease, and I would even add dementia. Age and diabetes are significant risk factors um, uh, for, for developing dementia. And then our microvascular uh, complications include retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy. Next slide. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, and I'm going to present to you over the next um, several minutes um, different models of care uh, that have been used successfully in the United States um, to improve uh, the care for these uh, older individuals in rural communities. and. Uh, the four uh, modalities that I'll speak of is telemedicine, uh, community health advisors, Project ECHO, and the Pacific Care model. Next slide. So telemedicine, um, based on the definition from the American Telemedicine Association, it's the use of medical information exchange from one site to another via electronic communications to improve a patient's clinical health status. And you may hear telehealth and telemedicine being used interchangeably, um, but really telehealth is an umbrella term to include all um, electronic healthcare deliveries, including health administration options and medical education. Um, for telemedicine, there are um, two different modes. There's asynchronous, uh, meaning at one specific point in time, like remote patient monitoring or um, e-consults, and then synchronous, um, which you may be more familiar with, which is real time, um, like video conference. Um, so, so some examples of telemedicine include two-way two video, uh, emails, using smartphones, um, other wireless tools, and uh, telecommunication, telecommunication technology. Next slide. So in terms of telemedicine and, and diabetes care, um, the most effective um, form of, of telehealth is using um, video call. Um, and that's been shown for um, patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, it may be even as effective as face-to-face uh, -face visits. Um, and an important thing to note is that Diabetes self-management education and support can be uh, delivered successfully through telemedicine. Um, the video um, telehealth models have also um, been shown to have improvements in self-behavior, uh, so, so, sorry, self-management behaviors, diabetes knowledge, uh, patient satisfaction and empowerment um, in improving uh, hemoglobin A1C and glycemic control, um, as well as retinopathy screening and diabetic foot monitoring. Um, for those of you who are not um, well-versed with retinopathy screening and telemedicine, um, it's definitely becoming more up and coming. Um, the patients can um, either travel to their primary care physician office or a site with a retinal photographer and have their images taken um, and these images are then transmitted electronically to an ophthalmologist um, who can decide whether or not the patient requires uh, specific diabetes treatment. Next slide. There's also been significant advances in, in technology for diabetes. Um, I think more recently, especially with COVID-19, we're utilizing these technologies more frequently, um, and they include diabetes share apps and platforms um, that have really enabled patients to upload their data from glucometers, continuous glucose monitors, and or insulin pumps um, so that their primary care providers or endocrinologists uh, can guide uh, the treatment plan. And the, this um, uh, just shows a, a different um, share apps and platforms that are available, but there's, there's many more um, on the market. Next slide. 
I do want to bring um, your attention to some barriers uh, to telemedicine um, that I've experienced with, with um, some of my patients. Um, and the three main barriers that I've primarily encountered is the first is that the patient is not tech savvy or they don't have access to equipment. Um, and so really you have to enlist the help of family members or caregivers uh, to set them up um, on the computer um, or to use the other telecommunication technology. Um, an alternative strategy to address this challenge is having a telemedicine site um, for which the patient then travels um, to the site which has the appropriate technology. A lot of our patients have sensory impairment um, and so it's vital to, uh, that they have their glasses and hearing aids on, uh, that we minimize any background noise um, and involve a family or caregiver um, to ensure that the information is being relayed appropriately. And finally, uh, cognitive dysfunction um, can really uh, create um, a barrier to telemedicine. Um, it can also incre increase frustration, I think, for, and distress for not only the patient, but also for the, the provider um, who's trying to um, provide care over telemedicine. And so in these circumstances, you may want to consider uh, using simpler forms of communication, uh, like a telephone uh, and involving the family or caregiver. Next slide. Uh, another model of care that um, has been very successful um, is utilizing community health advisors or workers. And these are individuals who serve as a bridge between their ethnic, cultural, or geographic communities and healthcare providers and really engage their community to prevent diabetes and its complications through education, lifestyle changes, self-management, and social support. Um, and when I was doing outreach um, to Northern British Columbia, we relied heavily on community health advisors um, who had a a trust uh, who really built trust um, with their communities. Um, and this was important, particularly for our Aboriginal population. Um, the community health advisor, advisors were vital in informing us which patients really needed additional help. And they also were very resourceful in providing support for the patients. Um, the Community Preventative Services Task Force um, put out a recommendation in 2016 um, to really um, involve interventions that engage uh, community health advisors to help patients manage their diabetes. Next slide. Um, what they found um, doing a systematic review looking at 44 studies uh, was that community health advisors uh, can help improve glycemic control uh, with a mean change hemoglobin A1C of 0.5%. And I would say that this is quite significant considering some of the newer um, oral uh, hypoglycemic agents um, have around the same mean change of hemoglobin A1C. Um, the community health advisors also had a greater proportion of patients at goal A1C, and it was able to reduce emergency department visits, uh, improve lipid control, uh, improve health behavior outcomes in the fields of physical activity and nutrition, as well as reduce health disparities. Uh, and to top it all off, um, community health advisors are very cost effective. Next slide. Um, another model of care that I want to bring uh, your attention to um, is Project ECHO, um, which stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. Um, this wonderful project was launched in 2003 by the University of New Mexico, and it's really a tele-mentoring uh, model of care uh, where they link primary care physicians in rural communities with expert specialists at an academic hub um, or urban site. And the primary care providers have the opportunity to present de-identified cases um, to the specialists as well as to each other and have the opportunity to develop subspecialty expertise over time. Um, studies have shown that the care provided by the participants is as safe and effective as that of specialists. Um, and then this little poster here on the the right um, really shows um, what ECHO is all about. It's, it's all teach and all learn. It's interactive. Uh, there's co-management of cases, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, uh, and collaborative problem solving. Next slide. 
Um, and so Project Echo has a sub um, uh, project called Endo Echo, uh, which focuses on diabetes um, care. And what they do is they offer weekly uh, video conferencing sessions where the ECHO specialist team uh, connects with the PCP and the community healthcare workers um, to discuss um, the cases. Um, and so the endo echo specialist team uh, would consist of, of either an adult endocrinologist or a pediatric, pediatric endocrinologist. Uh, there would be a team member from psychiatry, a diabetes educator, um, a nephrologist, pharmacist, social worker, and community healthcare worker. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, there's practice-based learning with the de-identified cases, but there's also the opportunity for didactic sessions um, that are curriculum-based. Um, for the primary care provider as well as for the community health care uh, worker. Um, and the didactic sessions for the community health care worker um, focuses on uh, health coaching around medication adherence, uh, self-monitoring, nutrition, physical activity, and behavioral changes. Next slide. Um, and in the literature, endoecho has been shown to improve patient reported access to healthcare, healthcare quality, self care behaviors, and quality of life. And it's also been shown to improve confidence in complex diabetes management among primary care providers and community healthcare workers. Next slide. So I went on the Project ECHO website um, just to show you um, which states um, have ECHO hubs. Um, so in the states, there's 18 academic hubs, um, and there's even one on uh, for Hawaii. Um, there's a total of 23 uh, different hubs, um, uh, and so uh, most of them, as you can see, are located in more urbanly populated areas, um, but they have the capability uh, to help uh, anyone across uh, the United States. Next slide. The last model that I will present um, is the Pacific Care model. Um, and the, I think this is an important model to highlight um, just because um, this region really found that um, their Pacific Islanders were being disproportionately affected by diabetes um, with prevalence up to 33%, which is very significant, um, and that they, they really needed to improve the care that was provided uh, to these patients in order to prevent complications. Um, so in 2009, the Pacific Chronic Disease Council was formed and they partnered with um, CDC, uh, Papa Ola Lokani, uh, which is the Hawaiian uh, Native Health, uh, and the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. Next slide. And what they did is that in uh, 2012, um, they created the Pacific Care Model, um, really integrating um, the Pacific Islanders culture uh, into the care model. Um, they drew upon um, the Pacific Islanders history of voyaging and star navigation uh, to create um, their framework, uh, where the canoe would be uh, representing the patients, the families and healthcare teams, and the stars would represent in Important parts of um, the um, the the important parts of the the care management, um, and so they created five coll collaborative teams of three to five members, which consisted of either a physician, a registered nurse, a dietitian, a community healthcare worker, and a data specialist, uh, and they selected fifty to one hundred patients uh, per collaborative team um, to really focus their energy. Um, one of the driving successes of this program was that they were very data and healthcare outcome driven. Um, and um, next slide. And what you can see is that over a 16th month uh, pilot project period, uh, they were able to improve glucose monitoring. Uh, they were able to reduce uh, hemoglobin A1C by 1.4%, which is very significant, um, increase screening for eye exams and foot exams, improve uh, blood pressure management, and improve uh, self-management behaviors. Next slide. So some key takeaways that you, um, are that older adults with diabetes living in rural communities 
face uh, many healthcare challenges. However, there are different strategies and models of care that can be utilized uh, to reduce health disparities and barriers. And the models of the care that are the most successful are tailored uh, to a specific population. Um, they're accessible and effective. There's strong leadership. Um, and these models are data and healthcare outcome driven uh, and finally cost effective. Next slide. And so I've put together some uh, resources um, that you can look at after um, this talk, um, just on uh, rural uh, communities and diabetes, um, as well as more information on EndoEcho. Um, and next slide. And I have left my contact information if you have um, any additional questions. And I'll turn it back to Ariel. Thank you so much, Dr. Sai. Uh, if there are any questions in the chat box for Dr. Sai, um, we can have uh, Jamie read them. If not, if you're thinking of questions or comments you'd like to share with Dr. Sai, feel free to be brainstorming them and we can bring them up during our Q&A at the end. All right. So we are going to transition now to a Q&A with a health center uh, in Maine. So Dr. Leonard Brennan is our geriatric training lead at the National Center for Equitable Care for Elders and is also the co-director of the Harvard School of Dental Medicine's Geriatric Fellowship Program, as well as a part-time lecturer in uh, our Department of Oral Health Policy and Epidemiology. Dr. Brennan has practiced general dentistry in Portland, Maine for over 30 years. He is going to facilitate a Q&A with Debbie Pottle, who is a nurse care coordinator at the Eastport Health Center in Maine. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Brennan now. Thank you, Ariel. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go right ahead. All right. Um, this is really a pleasure for, for me. As I travel the state of Maine, I have a chance to meet many of the, the rural outposts of rural, rural communities. And in Maine, what makes the rural health care centers work is that it, they're really neighbors. It's neighbors helping neighbors. And there's quite a distance sometimes between communities. And so you have to rely on innovative people like Debbie, uh, who, who can really make something that really works for the community. And so uh, just before I introduce Debbie, I, I, I just, Maine has have a reputation to be able to size up a situation and then we roll up our sleeves, we seem to take charge and solve the problem. There are two people I'd like to recognize as we kind of go through this question and answer. First, it's uh, Sarah, Mo uh, Sarah Morrow, who works for the Primary Care Association and she's the Quality Improvement Manager. She's been terrific in helping uh, and working with these, uh, these, these rural outposts and health centers in Maine. So thank you very much, Sarah. And Debbie is, when I think of healthcare, I think of individuals like Debbie Pottle. She is working in a, in a community where, as in many other communities, the aged to caring for the aged. Uh, it is, there is a access distance to get training. You just, it's, it's not like being in a city where you can just call up and come over to see somebody. You know, it takes a lot to be trained and a lot to implement. So just a little bit about Debbie. Uh, Debbie Pottle is an RN, a, a care coordinator for the Eastport Health Center. Eastport, Maine is the most Eastern part of the United States. So it's a very rural, uh, wonderful community. She has over 13 years of experience in family medicine. And as she, she has received certification as a diabetes education uh, educator. Her focus is to provide patient education, uh, which provides patients with the ability to make informed choices and assume, assume responsibility for their own care. She has received lifestyle coach training, and she's excited to bring the CDC-approved diabetes prevention program to Eastport Health Center. She lives in Perry with her spouse. She enjoys hiking, boating, snowshoeing, and spending time with her family. So Debbie, if you uh, can kind of lead us through your program and how you got involved with it and some of your accomplishments, that would be terrific. Thank you. Um, so like, he, I'm Debbie Pottle from Eastport. 
I live, actually live in Perry, but work for Eastport Healthcare. And actually Eastport Healthcare recruited, they were looking for an RN interested in chronic care with a focus on diabetes. And so the vision statement is, the, the vision statement is there that we want to meet a full spectrum of health needs in rural Maine with in and native affordable treatment leading through listening, learning, through partnership, and serving through collaboration for better health, health outcomes in Washington County. And so this is where, you know, I was recruited and hired and we started this journey. Next slide. So where we are, so we obtained accreditation with the, um, for diabetes self-management education in 2016. And then at the same time, I did the whole lifestyle. I was working on the lifestyle coach training, which we achieved in 2017. And right now we have three lifestyle coaches on staff to deliver the program. And we did become an MDDP for Medicare supplier in 2019. So a little bit about um, our area. We are very rural. We have the highest rate of uninsured about 10.4% and very low income about 17.5%. And our Medicaid is 14% and our Medicare is 35%. And with some, with 10.5% of our patients on a sliding fee. So chronically ill and older state here in Washington County. And we are, we are limited to access to the urban areas. The closest diabetes program was over two hours away. And so it became a vision of mine working and seeing that we didn't have the care here to be able to deliver these programs. Next slide. So we Eastport Healthcare supported in the essential programs and we started to say, well, we can't do this on our own. So we needed to have external, external partners join us. And so we didn't have a registered dietitian on site, but Callis Regional Hospital did. And so Mona and I started talking even before all this. And that's how we became collaborated that we can offer both diabetes education and medical nutrition therapy. And then as Dr. Sai was saying about the barriers, you know, we had to work with food banks for healthier options looking at a local optometry, talking about retinopathy and how can we offer low cost eye exams to all our uninsured patients with diabetes. And then we were fortunate for the integrated care on site to be the, to, to start discussing dental screenings and behavioral health services coordination and also um, started to work with the podiatry department on inter making sure that we were all interdisciplined in everything that we were trying to do here. Next slide. So where we are now, when we started, I think my first year I had about 10 patients complete this program. And right now I have 60 enrolled and 23 have completed so far for, my, um, for this year. And we now offer continuous glucose monitoring on site. Now, even the personal continuous glucose monitoring, and that has been, I wasn't sure how that would go with the elderly population, but it is working out really well. We have a community health, not necessarily a community health worker, but a cancer support who does a way to wellness classes each while we're before COVID. And then the diabetes prevention, which we are starting to do virtually because of COVID at this point. And so our external partners include Humane Extension, Cancer Support, um, Smoking Sensation, and um, right now, lifestyle, Healthy Lifestyle Living for Me, we've been trying to work with them in Healthy Acadia. And I, re I received my certification for CGM. And right now I'm working on my certification for insulin pump training with Medtronics in tandem to be able to offer that here in Washington County as well. Next slide. And the barriers. Um, did you wanna leave this, lead this? Well, it's up, um, it's up to you, Deborah. If you wanna go through these now, we can we can go through some of these together if you'd like, or if you want to continue and come back to these. Okay, Let's we'll go through some of these together. Great. So this, this, uh, some of the barriers, one of the questions that, that I was interested in 
is that, you know, when I visited Eastport, when you were bringing a program like this to your community, it, it is really kind of a multidisciplinary team that you have to put together. And I was wondering, what was the acceptance of, like when you had the, the, the physicians and the dentists and the optometrists in the community? Um, do you have a good acceptance? Did you have, do anything to bring them on board? I had to bring them on. I think some of them were skeptical that we could make this happen. You know, you had to be tr totally innovative. We didn't have a program here. I, you know, I did um, communicate with the other uh, educators in Bangor, and I worked really closely with the main CDC to help me, help me bring their providers and everybody on board. And I was probably here six months before they really, really got on board with this. And so did you, it did, did take over a year process to get this up and running. Well, so in uh, working with billing uh, did, and, you know. When you, um, when you, did you have to sit down and meet with them in person? Yes. Isn't that the New England way, huh? We, that is the New England way. That is the New England way, when they meet you face to face. But I think in a community, I, the, I think that's the biggest selling point is if you believe in something and you have eye to eye contact, it makes a difference, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, how did you get involved with the University of Maine Extension Service? And could you explain what that is a little bit? Because well, so they offer um, education, and I mostly worked with Al, um, who did Dining with Diabetes, and so it's a program. It's it's they follow a, um, a cooking. They do a cooking demonstration where they actually have people with diabetes uh, and their and their support person that can, can also attend. And so we offered this, I think it was six sessions and with from the meal from start to finish that had you know the, the main meal and also a low calorie, low carb dessert at the end of it. And it was all shared amongst themselves. That's good. So part of your team then, you had to recruit the University of Maine. Yes. As really fingers in every part of the state. Mm-hmm they could help educate your patients. And they also do more than that. Did you just say they also would have teach uh, cooking classes to show clients how to prepare a diet that would be helpful for them? Yes. And how was the turnout for that? We had 20 when we did it here two years ago. Oh, that's, that's really, really great. Um, the, the, so after you have, um, uh, looked at some of these some of these barriers do you find that money or transportation is a barrier in these port yes it is um what is the, what is the greatest to covid um we were working with the city of eastport actually and to get a transportation vehicles to help the local re patients residents here in eastport get to their medical appointments and even grocery shopping it's kind of been on hold, but it still is being in the process of, you know, having this transportation van available for, for Eastport residents. That's great. I have just one other question on the, um, on the, one of the, the barriers, and I will go on to another question, but in a lot of rural areas around the United States, I know it's specifically in Maine, we have a lot of the younger individuals moving out of rural Maine into more urban or moving out of the state. And so you have that challenge of uh, the more senior individuals managing and treating other senior individuals. Did you find that in Eastport that the that, a, that an older group is caring for the aged? Yes, I do, very much so. You see that neighbors are taking care of neighbors, especially now. Uh, you know, the ones that are able, senior companions, you know, they, they really come to the front and offering to do grocery shopping for those ones that are higher at risk. So they don't even have to go grocery shopping at this point. Oh, that's great. Uh, uh, I have a question. Could you share any strategies um, that, that you've used to improve the diabetes quality metrics? I mean, in your older patients? In older patients? Yes. It's really meeting them where they're at, you know, really knowing what their value system is, what their values are in relation to their chronic disease. We all know clinically what they should be, but sometimes 
they're not on that same page and we have to recognize that as providers that we have to value where they where they are and um, know that they may not be ready to make any significant changes but having them engaged developing that rapport with them and really not expecting you know, not having really high expectations, but let them be empowered to want to take care of their diabetes. Um, you know, I just had somebody recently that I asked them what their blood sugar goals and their blood sugar goal was just to get it out of 200 and not worry about the ADA standard. So, you know, it's really understanding who you're caring for. Like Dr. Sai was saying, that educational component of, so where they know where their, their health is connected to what they do makes a difference. Exactly. And, and it does, I believe, help having a neighbor in the community. I have a feeling, Debbie, that when you talk to patients that are smoking or that have financial issues, uh, you can relate to that community since you're a member of that community. And I, I, I just sense your personality and your way must make a difference with these patients. Yeah, so, you know, tobacco cessation is the same thing. You ass I assess their readiness. I, you know, I let them know, you know, how it complicates their diabetes. But I, one thing I've learned is scare tactics don't work, if, you know, but just trying to meet them there and understanding that some of them have trouble affording their medication. And when you really get down to it, you know, they either, you know, their A1C will be doing really good you know, before donut hole hits, and then all of a sudden you find out they're decreasing their insulin to make it last. So it's these strategies there of who we can work with. Um, so, but, and we do have, luckily here, I have somebody who assists me with patient assist. We try, I, I work with the pharmaceutical companies, contacting them, you know, trying to, if they're in the donut hole, trying to get them a break, try to have some samples on hand for them. But medication costs for, you know, for those with diabetes, especially when they're on a fixed income is very difficult. And we've Eventually. had to go some of the older agents, I'm using NPH insulin more than some, in some of them instead of the analogs. and really being careful of, you know, hopefully uh, being careful of trying to avoid the low blood sugars with that, with the NPH, the older medications. Uh, I have a question, Debbie. Uh, the, one of the attendees uh, asked a question similar to what we've been talking about, but it's what are the challenges that you were faced with a diverse patient load? It, with what? Diverse, a different patient load. Yeah, you know, you have, um, you know, financial, maybe cultural differences, langer, language barriers. Generally, that's not an issue, I believe, in Eastport. It's not an issue in Eastport. Um, most of our population is mostly white and English speaking, uh, 90, about 94%. We do live nearby a, um, a, reser a reservation, Native American. So about 4% from Pleasant Point do, do use Eastport Health Healthcare Services. And culturally with them, you know, their meal plan would look totally different from, from you know, a person from Eastport. Is, is transport a problem uh, for the Native Americans coming into the clinic? Or do you go to the, to them? No, they come to us. We're only five miles, six miles from the reservation. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. transportation hasn't been there. Where I have had the most difficult with transportation is because we do Callis is about 30 minutes away. And so some of my referrals from Callis do have problems with transportation for an access. Do they have any different uh, pro access problems of food differences or health differences that you have to direct towards that population specifically? The health differences, um, hmm, they, they tend to, those ones really tend to be heavy, you know, heavy smokers, mm -hmm. um, you know, poverty, you know, it's, it's the same, poverty, they tend to, the cultural, you know, they, they have meals with families and, you know, and they usually big meals. So, you know, so a little bit different, but 
mm -hmm. you know, overall, it's just, you know, working with them and what's going to work with for them. That's great. Uh, uh, just a question with the, the COVID-19, how has that affected how you, you, you talk with patients, engage with patients, monitor and follow up with patients? encourage patients yeah we um, so we are able to offer telehealth for the um, some have really embraced it because it really you know the ones especially with transportation issues a couple of referrals that I had sitting that they couldn't make all of a sudden we were able to connect through telehealth um, the ones I do um, the technology I will say I don't know if any rural if you've been here but internet access can be very mm. difficult broadband when it works it's great but you know i've had trouble audio with the telehealth and so we've had to use the phone so um the but what, i some do prefer the face to face what the, percent of the seniors have uh, access to a computer um, oh. I mean, well, I would say about 30% of mine right now. I probably have, you know, I would, you know, because a lot of them don't have a computer or a smartphone. I, I mean, I had, when I was trying to, or an iPad, they, they, some of them have not heard of it. And then when some of them are doing, uh, do have it and, you know, or they have a family member that can help them. So that has been really good as if the family member can help them. Uh, this is a question. What can healthcare providers and staff do to promote clear communications with older patients during a telehealth visit? I mean, I, I suspect that um, they may not have a computer, so they may have to visit a son or a grandson or a neighbor or just yeah, a that's what happens, you know. Um, so the medical assistants have been really good if we needed help to get them set up ahead of time or if they needed to work with with the patient or the spouse. And so we've been able to utilize them because we're having less patients come in in-house. So we've been using that a lot of times ahead of their appointment to help them get set up. I mean, we have talks with the providers and um, we have Axiom who's working to see if we can get tablets. So, so we're trying to do, to try and come up with some innovative ways to get tablets to patients, but we're not there yet. Okay. Um, one of the attendees asked the question, and you, you seem to be dealing with some of these strategies really well. And the question is, what are strategies that you utilize to keep the patients motivated on their healthcare goals? That's one question. And the other is, um, do you follow up with a patient uh, on a consistent basis or is it monthly? Uh, I, it depends on motivation the strategies maybe first and then how do yeah. you follow up? The strategies, keeping them engaged. Yes. You know, it, we, it, when you develop that rapport with them, they do, they come back, you know, that I think that is the thing. And really when I really meet them for the first time, I really make it patient centered. I want them to tell me about their diabetes, not what I say as a provider or even what their provider wants, but I really want them to tell me about what their diabetes and what it means to them. And that's what a great point, Debbie. That's a great point. Yes. Yeah. And what was the other question? Uh, how do you follow up with patients? Did you follow up uh, on a consistent basis? Is it monthly? How do you kind of Keep yeah, that. usually it is monthly and I am consistent um, with the follow-ups. You know, I manage, you know, like I said, I got 60 enrolled and I run a QI report every month. I look at my no-shows and, you know, I, I, I average one to three no-shows a month, but I try and follow up and see if they want to follow up. I do have some that drop out and, um, and I let the provider know that either they weren't ready and sometimes they drop out because they're managing well on their own and I just let the, the provider lets me know that nope their A1C is really good they don't need you right now so you know I do now have that rapport with the providers in the area now that they've got to know me after four or five years and that I, I have no problem reaching out to them and saying if you know I haven't heard from this person what can you let me know what's going on. I suspect maybe one of the strategies to keep the other members of the team motivated is the success that they're seeing with the patients. Is that true? That is true. 
it, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing more motivating than success like that. So uh, congrats. I, as a dentist, I obviously have to ask the question when discussing diabetes management with, with patients, uh, is there a dentist that's part of the team? Yeah, we have, um, we have a dentist, Dr. Tari, and two hygienists, Sue Drew and Kathleen. And Sue is my champion. She is, you know, when I wanted to bring this program and, you know, dental was like right on board. And it wasn't until, you know, the program, we, four years, we're going into our fifth year this year. But last year is when her and I really worked on how can we improve dental screening. And so that became a part of my assessment questions in the beginning and asking them if they had a dental exam in the past 12 months. And if not, you know, how, how, what, you know, what was the barriers for you getting dental care? And a lot of it was the cost is not covered by insurance. And so one way to get him into the door was that Sue and I developed an oral health screen questionnaire. And so, and we worked with, you know, the CEO and CFO and said, you know, if we can get them to get the initial screen, maybe they can apply for a sliding scale or do anything like that. And so we do, we've developed that as part of our education process. Um, and we've had several, I, can't, I don't have the numbers in front of me and, as you know, dental's been hit hard that they haven't, so mm -hmm. Sue's been working mostly from home to get her numbers. But I know of 11 personally off the top of my head that had the free initial screen. And then I know seven of them have followed through and have continued to see dental. That's great. Uh, have any of those, uh, those, those, your clients noticed a difference with their oral health when the diabetes management came more under control? I think so because, you know, Sue, if we do any group classes, I always have heard her speak on oral health. And so she will, the link between the elevated A1C and gum care and, you know, and so, and, you know, she really, she has a wonderful way with them as well and, and really gets them engaged on, you know, on oral care. And so I think it's really helped. I know that you have a really interesting community. I was down at the uh, Machias Hospital uh, doing a talk on oral health and the nurses, physicians, hygienists, optometrists, there was a whole group that showed up uh, interested in their connection of oral health to total larger mm -hmm. community. Your education must be getting out. Um, and I know it's getting late, but how about this one last question is, sure. what additional partnerships would you like to see between the clinical and community groups in your area? Uh, I'm sorry, I had a, a vehicle go by. Pardon me? I, can you repeat that? Yes, it's on the screen. It says, what additional partnerships would you like to see between clinical and community groups in your area? Is oh, so we're working for the additional partnerships we're working with, um, of course, is Healthy Acadia. And we're working with Lifestyle for me, in fact, we just had some lay people and some staff that were really interested in being able to do Lifestyle for me, which is um, six sessions for anybody with chronic disease. And we started the process, we had 10 enrolled and COVID hit, so we weren't able to finish the trainings with the staff. So we're hoping to get that up and going again when we can start offering group sessions again. So the, there will be three different community groups. One will be chronic disease, one would be living with chronic pain, and one would be diabetes self-management. Great. So when you look back at the program and how successful it's been, if you were summing it up, what what are say two of the points that has made it the most successful for you? When you think about, because you have done so much with that community, what made it work? What made it work? I think the interpersonal relationships that, you know, we developed with the community as well with the providers and, and um, the staff here, the, you know, you know, I wasn't sure how this program would work and how, because we've never had anything like this in this area and wasn't really sure how people with diabetes would feel about coming for education when they've never really had any education because I'll tell you not many of them traveled to Bangor and mm. so but they embraced it 
you know, I would say that the community, the people with diabetes or pre-diabetes really embrace this program. And, you know, you know, I think that that speaks for itself and just seeing them empowered and, you know, being excited to call and say, you know, hey, my, my A1C, I'll get called, you know, I just saw my provider, my A1C was this and now it's that. And, um, you know, that also that I had on my foot, you know, saw the foot doctor and, you know, I'm, you know, the healing and, you know, so anything like that. So. If, Debbie, have you found that your success has motivated other healthcare clinics in rural Maine? Yes, I, I see this growing. I think it's an opportunity for rural areas, uh, you know, to, to really collaborate. One thing I learned, you could not do it on your own. We had to collaborate with, with different facilities, different partners, had to talk with Callis Hospital, you know, had to work with uh, food banks, had to work with um, all the, the dentists, and like you said, the optometry, you know, having those partnerships is what's made it all work too. Well, I think that's probably a good point to kind of leave it on because when other healthcare clinics see that it can be done and that it does work and the results for the patients are so successful, people will be more, more motivated to be involved in it. So congratulations for what you do. And I think we have time for questions now from the audience. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Brennan and Debbie, for that fantastic conversation. Um, we have just a few moments if there are other questions. Certainly, we appreciate those questions that have come in so far. I did also want to just for a moment turn that initial question um, over to Dr. Sai as well around challenges that may be faced with um, a diverse patient load around navigating those um, diabetes care management related conversations if there are cultural or language differences. Dr. Sai, do you have any um, response to that? Yeah, so when I was um, working up nor in northern BC, we have, a, it's very diverse. I mean, there are, it's, it is predominantly white and aboriginal, um, but even the way that we provide care to the aboriginal population is quite different than usual care um, in the sense that um, it relies heavily on trust. Uh, so we, like I mentioned earlier, we really relied heavily on our community healthcare workers who had that in already with the community and that trust. Um, and then I think Debbie highlighted a very important point earlier about trying to um, see where the patients are at with their diabetes and what are their goals for their health because that as a as a healthcare provider it really helps you prioritize what is important for the patients and where diabetes stands in terms of their health priorities um, and you can really see eye to eye with them and then motivate them um, to to strive to to reach their goals so I think that I, I would just add that to um, to the response. Great, thank you. Uh, well, since we are just moments away from the end of the hour, I want to encourage you all to provide feedback. If you're able, we'll put a link in the chat box um, to a very quick survey monkey. We'll also email that out to folks when we send the slides uh, momentarily. We do appreciate your time and participation. If you think of any other questions or comments you'd like to share with us, feel free to respond to the email um, that you receive this afternoon or be in touch with any of us directly. We'd be happy to uh, connect you after this with either uh, Dr. Sai, Dr. Brennan, or Debbie. Um, again, thank you. Have a fantastic afternoon.